Hello and welcome to a special AV Forums podcast. And as always, I'm joined by our regular Steve Withers. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. And also on the call today is Craig Cunningham from Samsung. Hello, Craig. Hey, good to be here. Um, so as you can guess, we've got Craig from Samsung on the call. We must be talking about Samsung. So we're going to cover the new 2021 TVs and the features. Uh, we're going to have our first reviews of Samsung products turning up on EV forums very soon. So we thought this was the best time uh, to get Craig in. So uh, Craig, some of our regulars will know who you are. Obviously, you, you've been on the podcast and videos uh, quite a bit. But for those that are not aware of who you are, maybe you could just very quickly tell us what you do. Uh, well, I head up uh, TV and AV product marketing um, for Samsung Europe. Okay. Um, right. So let's crack on. Let's get into it. Uh, nice and easy. Uh, tell us all about the new features for 2021. Well, let's uh, let's start with uh, with order of uh, excitement then. So uh, this year we are launching micro LED in a in a consumer proposition, so a fixed form consumer proposition. So I think that's um, that's really exciting. I think it really shows where the industry is going. Um, I think in terms of picture quality, it's you know it's 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 everything that the the industry has been working towards for a number of years. It's a, it's a self emissive, inorganic, high brightness RGB product. So it's the it's the kind of holy grail of, of hardware technology. Um, so that that for me is really exciting. We will launch that in a in a couple of screen sizes. Um, we have 110 inch and 99 inch confirmed. Obviously, those are those are very very large screens but we are looking at opportunities for expansion into around the 80 inch area and also um, a 70 75 76 um, proposition as well so um, at the moment still a very very niche product but in terms of product quality i think it's um, it's really showing where we're going to go as an industry that's um that's really exciting and then in terms of screen sizes and addressing more mass market i think that's definitely going to be on the horizon Obviously, micro LED as a technology has been around for a while. You have been using it in the wall. I mean, it's been available um, as I guess as a custom install um, yeah. feature, quite a high end product. You've got these new screen sizes coming out. First question is, um, are they single units rather than just composed of modules? And um, when can we realistically expect to see a, a, a micro LED TV that could be classed as a genuine mass market consumer product as opposed to a very, very high end uh, unit? Well, well, to answer your first question, so they are fixed form. So this isn't modular. So this is a true uh, B2C proposition. And then in terms of, uh, you know, reaching that mass market, I mean, even even if we call it the premium market, I think that's still that's still away um, I think we still have to you know you, we have to reach scale and capacity in order for that to happen but you know I think for every resolution every technology that's been launched in our industry I think that's that's been the same it always um, launches first of all as, as concepts as we have done previously then you have a real sellable proposition as we have now and then uh, second third fourth generation start to expand you know expand the uh the, the screen sizes and also which which consumers uh, consumers can um you know can have access to them so i think i think that's a natural progression and i'm sure that's going to happen over the next um the next couple of years will it be um um always limited to large screen sizes because of the nature of the pixel density and the rgb sub pixels or, or could it get to smaller screen sizes you know, you know things that people would associate more regularly with 55 and 65 inches for example i think the potential is there I think it. I think it. Um, I think it can be done. But I think um, if we look at the areas of the market which are showing growth, um, that re that really is the larger screen sizes uh, in the market. So 75 inch and above. Um, th those are where the opportunities lie at the moment. Um, that's where the the large screen premium business is being done. Uh, but that's not to say that it couldn't become available in, in 65 or 55. But that will depend on the overall product strategy, which. Um, you know, I'm sure will be made clear in the coming uh, the coming months and years. So, with this being one unit instead of modular, why is that? Have you moved away from modular, or is modular still something that you're looking at? Well, I think modular is still uh, is still very much applicable for our for our B2B wall offerings. I think that just uh, that fits that market. So, it's, it's a predominantly custom installation um, business. But for a for a true consumer proposition, fixed more fixed display seems to be. Uh, you know, more appropriate. You know, your average consumer wants to have a complete proposition. You might get it installed on the wall, but you're not necessarily looking for a professional installation of having multiple segments put together. So yeah. it is a single panel and not composed of modules within the panel. That's right. That's what I'm, yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess that that really does make sense. And the other one that we have to to cover at this point is obviously it is a premium product at the minute. Um, obviously, we work on the internet. The internet wants answers yesterday uh, and wants things to happen yesterday. But realistically, where are we looking at in terms of scale and getting the pricing down so it's more realistic for a consumer? Well, I think at the moment, due to it being <clears throat> very large screen sizes and based on the technology really being in its infancy, I think that's um, that's putting that into very niche price points as of now and also very selective distribution as well you know this is not this isn't these are not types of products that you'll see in um, just any any store um, however you know th there is a there is a desire within the company to significantly expand micro led as um, as we go forward as we move forward into uh, to next year and beyond so um, I don't have a concrete answer for you in terms of when when are we going to have a 65 inch at x price point I think that's still that's still TVC but we know as a company what price points and what parts of the market need to be activated in order to sell significant volumes. So those two things will go hand in hand as the production and scale ramps up. Um, clearly, that means the product has to be much more accessible to a greater number of people. Yeah, obviously, that does make sense. Uh, for you, where do you think micro LED uh, scores in terms of the future of TV? What is it that makes it, in your opinion, the future of TV eventually? Well, I think if you look at all of the propositions that are out there right now, um, consumers have to make some sort of a compromise. Okay, there is, There are either self-emissive uh, organic technologies where you, you get great pixel for pixel control, but you make that compromise on, uh, on brightness. Or you have uh, high brightness, but again, you make that compromise on uh, the, the how much you can control the panel you don't have that pixel for pixel control you have some sort of backlight technology those are kind of two sides of the pyramid at the top of that pyramid then is micro led which takes away the challenges felt with both technologies that are in the market right now so as a technology solution it is without compromise and can deliver the best picture quality due to the the way it can be controlled um, the rgb nature as well um, and the high brightness capability. So it ticks It ticks pretty much every box. Um, the only thing it's not ticking right now is it's not available in the market for you know, hundreds of thousands of consumers to access. So that, that's where the product needs to get to. But from a pure technology proposition, it is, it's peerless. So Craig, obviously that was a bit of a leading question because uh, our members and people who are enthusiasts, they tend to look at the numbers and, and see how many zones are and so on. But it's not just the number of zones and how many LEDs you have, it's how they are controlled. And that's normally through a dimming algorithm. And uh, you guys have always you know, put a lot of effort into your algorithm. So how have you changed that to, to manage mini LED? Yeah, I think that's arguably probably the hardest part of um of managing the picture quality on the Neo QLED um, with thousands of uh, uh, mini LEDs, it takes a lot more processing, a lot more control. Um, so we've introduced quantum matrix technology. So this is the part of the processor which controls directly the signal to the backlight to make sure that we are in full control. Um, we are sending power to where power is needed and we're also able to, um, you know, to, to control not only the brightness, but the uh, the dark scenes and the um, the gradation that's required um, based on whatever content consumers are are watching. So that new technology is really what's delivering the picture quality for Neo QLED. You, you're using um, Mini LED. You're not the only manufacturer that's doing that this year. What do you think makes your approach to Mini LED better than the competition? Um, well, I think it's quite difficult to answer that question i haven't really seen reviews of uh many of the competitors models i mean maybe you, you guys have seen more more than i have um, i can only speak from from our point of view and obviously the reviews that we're able to to get and the initial feedback that we've had from guys that have seen the product um has been very very complimentary um, and we know from our own test versus our best products last year that these have taken significant steps forward um i think as, as i mentioned in my previous uh, my previous answer on the quantum matrix technology the hardware is really just one part of it. If you're not able to control that, you know that that complex technology of uh, of mini LED, um, I think you know you you can see some some artifacts in in the picture. So what we're able to do is, with all of that experience that we've had of managing direct full array, able to take that learning, adapt that, um, introduce quantum matrix technology, and have the utmost maximum control that we can have over the picture that's delivered. 
so so far we've talked we've spoken about micro led and now we're talking about mini led is there a danger that consumers are going to be confused with two very similar terms for two very different technologies not not from our part no i think we're um, i think we're always very clear on the communication um, and as i mentioned earlier when we were talking about micro led um it won't be easy just to go into a store to see micro led it really is um um, limited in terms of its, its its distribution and its um, consumer reach right now because it is such a uh, such a high ticket item. Whereas if you go into majority of uh, of stores, you'll be able to get a representation of Neo QLED. And of course, we're very clear on all of our communications as well. You can you can shop the Samsung website and you'll see um, lots of detail on what Neo QLED is, and you will also find out about next generation micro LED as well. So that is something that we're always we're always conscious of and that's our responsibility to make sure that consumers are um, being informed of what is the correct proposition. I was more concerned about the competition deliberately trying to, you know, confuse consumers by using the term mini LED um, to sell a product that is essentially an LCD panel with more back, you know, with more living zones and, and a back, different, slightly different backlight rather than micro LED, which is obviously a completely different technology from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be the first time in our industry that it <laughs> over over terminology, but no, we, we'll do all we can to be as clear as we can possibly be. Right, let's move into some of the technology then, Craig. Uh, so we've we've touched on uh, the algorithm and so on. So obviously, the TV does have the quantum processor, and uh, it's quite a powerful processor. It's been on the TVs for a number of years now, and, and you keep making tweaks to it. So for this year, what's new? So in terms of the, the smart and the learning capability, there's been some changes there. So I mentioned quantum matrix technology, that's one component. Um, the other part is the deep learning. So in previous generations, so 2020 um, and even before that, we've had one neural network. Now that's been responsible for learning all of the assets of the picture quality, um, the requirements for uh, the upscaling, uh, picture rendering, et cetera. What we're doing in 2021 is we're actually introducing 12 separate neural networks into the uh, into the products and they are controlled by a neural analyzer now each neural network will be responsible for a certain element of picture quality for looking into that and adapting that and making sure that it's represented as best as it can possibly be on the product the way i tend to think about it is previously we had one chef making all the dishes all the different types of cuisine now we have a dedicated chef for each separate area of picture quality and that delivers um, a much better experience. Um, it's faster learning, more intuitive, yeah, and ultimately a um, big step forward. Is it like previous years where the processing on the TV is is regularly up, updated based upon the machine learning being done at, a, at a, I guess, an offsite somewhere, and then the, the, an update sent out to the TVs on a semi regular basis? Yeah, and it has that it has that capability to do that as uh, as frequently or infrequently as we um, as we as we learn as we continue to learn as the products continue to learn. So um, always adapting, always improving. Right. So um, new LED TVs. We talked about the process, and uh, let's move on. Let's talk about some of the other features, Craig. So, what else can people expect from the new QLEDs this year? Um, sound has been a big focus for us. Uh, we've done a lot of research over the last couple of years and what we're finding with consumers is that sound's becoming more and more important and actually built in sound to the TV. So of course when we're talking about Neo QLED and premium TVs there is definitely a relationship there between consumers buying those products and premium sound devices which of course we uh, we offer as well but nevertheless the the inbuilt capability of sound for the TV is also important. So we introduced um, OTS in 2020, in 2020. Um, we've adapted that again for 2021. So essentially what we're doing is we have speakers in the, the bottom, the side and the top of the television. Now that's able to obviously create a much wider sound stage. You have a nice vertical um, sound so that you get that immersive experience. Also, when, when, you, when you attach one of our Q-series soundbars to one of our Neo QLED products, um, we have this very cool feature called Q-Symphony. Now, essentially what we're doing here is we are driving sound through the sound device, as you would expect, but we're leaving the side and the top speakers open on the TV as well. So again, creating that additional surround sound, that additional height and that overall experience is, um, yeah, it's been, it's been very well received. It's really, uh, it's really innovative and it's a big step forward for the, um, for the market. So that's, that's kind of what we've done from a sound point of view. 
an OTS is object tracking system. Like object sound. tracking sound, yeah. Object so tracking. if you have those speakers on the, let's say, top, bottom, left, right of the TV, if um, if you can imagine a car going across the TV, that sound um, coming from the car should feel like it's going across your living room. We're able to generate that because we have speakers on either side of the TV or we have a helicopter coming in from the top of the image. The sound will come from the speakers in the top of the TV. So it's a, it's a surround sound system built into the TV. It's okay. compatible with uh, Dolby Atmos, Craig. Yes, it is. Yeah. So if you're watching um, Atmos content via, you know, take Netflix as an example, um, those side and top speakers will also be open. And we've worked closely with Dolby to make sure that we have that, that algorithm correct so that it's representing the sound properly. Okay, because it doesn't actually have the, the Atmos logo on the TV, does it? So it, but it is compatible. When you connect it, so the TVs do pass through Atmos. So if you're watching, uh, if you're watching Netflix and you have a Q series sound device attached to your TV, you will be getting the Atmos version of the track by your your sound device, which will also then be using the speakers in the TV. But well, sorry, so on the but on the TV, so you're not just using the TV on its own. Does it internally decode Dolby Atmos? No. So the, the TV on its own does not produce uh, Dolby Atmos. Well, what's the reasoning behind that given you put all these speakers in which is a great idea you got the technology there to to make, make use of something that's already in the did you know in the stream why not um, just decode it for consumers yeah i mean that's a that's a similar uh, that's a similar answer to why don't we uh, why don't we have dolby vision on the we'll come back to that one at the end of this <laughs> which we can uh, which i'm sure we'll, we'll come back to later on the, uh, later on in the podcast but um no the, the focus has been putting on the 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 speakers to improve the overall sound um, the sound experience what functionalities we support or what inputs we support obviously is still is still open for discussion right because it, it, um, it is a confusing thing sorry steve it, it is a confusing cool. item because you have these you know upward fine speakers the sideways fine speakers and the downward speakers and like like steve says it makes it's for a consumer it would it would appear to be illogical that the tv doesn't support Dolby Atmos. So, but the way around it is to add in a, a device that can do Dolby Atmos, and then the TV can take that. So, if it's a Q Symphony soundbar, then it will work with that. Yeah. yeah I mean, we're, all, we're also conscious of the fact that, you know, that there are different types of Dolby Atmos, right? There are different Atmos experiences. There is the adding in a, a, a sound device and having upfiring sound um, to deliver a true Atmos experience. There is also, I think, what we refer to in the industry as a virtual Atmos experience, where you can say your TV supports Dolby Atmos, you can have no sound device attached, but ultimately you have two speakers in the bottom left and right of your TV. Yeah. That's a very different Dolby Atmos experience. <laughs> so you, know, you, have, you have to tread that fine line as to what you tell the, t the consumers the TV can do, but what it can actually do. So, so Greg, this, this year there's more than one flavor of OTS, is that correct? Yeah, if you step as you step through the lineup, we start to introduce more speakers. So we have OTS, we have OTS Plus, and we have OTS uh, Pro on the flagship model. So essentially, that's just down to number of speakers. Um, to give an example, our Q80A um, product has OTS. We have speakers in the bottom of the TV, and we also have the speakers in the top of the TV, but they don't feature the side speakers. Um, and as you step through the range, we start to add in more speakers, and obviously that improves the the overall sound experience. And with the pro version, there's a dedicated center speaker as well. At the that's bottom. right. Yeah, that that, right? That's, what make, that's what steps us up from uh, OTS Plus to OTS Pro. And uh, I'm always impressed with Tizen. So what changes have you made or have you made any changes with Tizen this year? Um, not from from an operating system point of view, not not a huge amount. Um, we, we changed slightly Good. the layout. There are, there, are more, there are more application or more separate windows um, available. Um, not a huge amount of changes from the operation point of view. However, there have been um, improvements on some of the smart some of the smart features. Um, just to, to, to name a few, um, we now support Google Duo, which I think more people uh, are coming to appreciate as we've all spent much more time on Zoom calls and video calls and Teams calls over the last year. I think um, adding a camera now to your TV and having a, a Google Duo call with family or friends will be considered quite normal, I think. Um, so that's that's one that's one area of improvement from a smart capability. Um, yeah, I mean there have been there have been various others. TV Plus is another good example. So TV Plus is um, is our own TV channel where we're we're constantly adding content. Um, we've actually just launched their Baywatch channel, 
So we've acquired the rights for all uh, all Baywatch. So if you can't get enough of David Hasselhoff, then um, Samsung TV might be the right might be the right one for you. <laughs> um, we also have our own comedy channel as well, which is uh, packed full of well-known um, stand-up comedy um, guys. Uh, what else is there? Yeah, just it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to name all of the uh, all the innovations. There's certainly been uh, there's certainly been plenty. And of course, uh, moving on to HDR, you have your HDR10 Plus, so that's been updated as well this year. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we now support um, HDR10 Plus adaptive. So I think um, again, considering the the the, uh, the environment which consumers are watching um, programs, um, I think having an adaptive technology which adjusts to the the ambient light in the room, I think that's um, that's very welcome. So that's one step forward that we've made from HDR10 Plus point of view. Craig, um, there's been a few changes on the hardware side as well, hasn't there? Because um, both the One Connect box and the remote seem to have had a, have a had an upgrade this year. Yeah, sustainability is a, is a is a huge passion of the of the company, and it was um, when we announced our 2021 lineup, it was one of the leading points that we wanted to make. Um, so there are various areas in which we've we've tried to deliver on that promise. One of them is um, we've removed the batteries from the majority of the remote controls now, and they're actually solar powered. Um, but they will power in in the light of pretty much any any standard living room. Um, so removing the need to replace batteries. Um, so that's that's one area. The the other is the um, the packaging. So we also you can see from our previous um, lifestyle TV. Uh, strategy. We've also been making sure the packaging is recyclable and also being used for other um, other areas as well. So to give an example, um, we've seen many consumers taking our frame or, or serif packaging and actually turning it into various um, household items, whether that be a, a cat house or um, a table or um, any other piece of furniture. And we, we provide information as to how to create that as well, just to avoid the need of throwing that material away. And it looks like you put the One Connect box on a diet. Uh, uh, the, for the one, for the One Connect box, yeah. So the uh, the flagship model, so the Q800, the Q900. What we've been able to do this year is we've significantly slimmed down that that One Connect box, which is is such an appreciated feature. I mean, I I never realised until I joined Samsung actually how much appreciation there is for the One Connect box. To have one simple device to plug all of your inputs. Um, without having to mess around at the back of the TV has been um, has been greatly appreciated. So we've been able to slim this down significantly and integrate it into the back of the pedestal. So it almost becomes the neck between the uh, the TV display and the pedestal stand. Um, yeah, that, that's allowed us to keep the TVs, I mean, extremely thin. We have 15 millimeter profile on our flagship models from top to bottom. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's another big step forward. Um, let's move on to gaming because that is a huge market now, Craig. And uh, all TVs have to have to reach a certain standard these days. So, what new features do you have for for gamers? And um, I am assuming now that most of the HDMI ports, because I haven't seen one of your TVs yet this year, but I'm assuming that most of the the HDMI ports will be 2.1. Yeah, as you say, uh, gaming is a is a is a huge market and i think the the rate of growth is really um is really incredible so it's a it's a big big focus for us um as you say we have hdmi 2.1 features on most of our tvs obviously that varies as you go through the lineup depending on the refresh rates of the products and the processing capability etc um, to give an example the the q70 series and above they all have full hdmi 2.1 capability now the number of inputs again changes depending on the depending on the series. You'll have more on the flagship products than you will on um, a model like Q70, as an example. Um, but that's covering the full the full spectrum of HDMI 2.1 requirements. So I think that's that's good. I think that's a, that's also really important. But we've introduced quite a few dedicated gaming features as well. Um, to give you an example, we have super ultra wide uh, game view. So what you're able to do then as a consumer is you can change the aspect ratio of the TV to match the game. So whether that be uh, 32 by 9, 21 by 9. So you can uh, you can match the game's native aspect ratio. We also have a game bar as well that you can activate, which will come up at the bottom of the screen. And that gives you in real time feedback all of the uh, responses from your game, whether that be um, the, the, the refresh rate, the input lag. Um, what Bluetooth devices you have connected. So it's really like a must-have connections system feedback 
based on the game that you're playing. So that's um, that's something else which is just dedicated for gaming, but I think um, you know shows how serious we are in this space. And what features are on the TVs? You mean so like the, VR, R, E, L, M, oh, uh, G Sync? Yeah, all, all, all of uh, not not G Sync, but we do have FreeSync Premium uh, Pro, which is something that we've newly added on to uh, to this year, which delivers low latency 4K uh, HDR. It allows the the tone and the gamut directly to be mapped to the display, which shortens the processing time. So overall, that delivers a much better 4K HDR gaming experience. Yeah, obviously, Craig Samsung well known for pushing 8K. Uh, it's it's your fourth year now that you've had uh, 8K TVs on the market. So what's the lineup for, for 2021 when it comes to 8K? Well, first of all, I mean, I don't I don't really consider these products to be 8K TV. When, whenever we're talking about them internally, we, we simply refer to them as our <clears throat> as our flagship products. Um, so for me, they are they are simply the best TVs that we can make within the Neo QLED lineup, and they feature an 8K panel. The, the reason I say that is we know that 8K as a as a resolution uh, and a format is still very much in its um, in its infancy. Um, and I think the the last year in, in general for content production has been has been a challenge. You know, we're we're all still watching the same things we were watching a year ago. You know, so there's been that there's been that delay. But the reasons to buy our Q800 TV or our Q900 TV go way beyond just um, just the resolution factor. Of course, they have an 8K screen in there, and we do believe that that is a uh, you know that is that is fitting of a premium flagship product, but the the whole picture quality, sound story, even the the processing power is all stronger, better in our flagship uh, in our flagship products. So just to give we can give some examples, um, the, uh, the the backlight system that we use on the on the Q800 Q900 um, has far more controllable um, dimming zones than the flagship 4K models. We have more speakers in the um, um, in, in the product. So we have those, as you, as you mentioned, we have a dedicated center speaker, bottom left, right side, top speaker for the uh, Q800 to Q900. We have the slim one connect box, which again is only available Q800, Q900. And with the, the Q900, we also have that revolutionary infinity screen design where we've removed all of the bezel, all of the black matrix. Um, so you have a very unique um, looking TV. So Flagship is very important to us, of which 8K is a big is a big part of that. Um, but those products will continue to sell based on them being the best TVs that we can make from the Neo QLED lineup. Um, and until 8K becomes, um, you know, the, the content increases, becomes more accessible to more consumers, we'll ha we will continue to push these TVs as our best TVs with an 8K resolution. So, what is the 8K lineup for this year? Well, we have a uh, we have a Q900, we have a Q800. So those screen sizes there are raising, uh, ranging from, uh, from from 65 inch up to up to 85 inch. Um, also looking at some larger screen size options for later on in the year. So in terms of lineup, it hasn't significantly expanded, and screen size options are still um, the same pretty much year on year. Um, but the step forward in the product, I would say, is bigger. If I looked at last year's lineup, maybe even 2019, in order to sell up to those larger screen sizes, those premium models, there wasn't as many arguments or reasons as what we've been able to produce in 2021. So I think in terms of sales performance, I'm expecting to see a significant increase in sales for Q800, Q900 versus the previous models. If somebody wanted to watch 8K content on their new 8K TV, uh, where would Samsung suggest they, they look for that kind of content in this country specifically rather than abroad? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we know it's limited. You know, I think everyone knows it's uh, it, it's it's limited. But we are we are seeing content and content makers um, now starting to to dabble into the world of 8K. I mean, the first thing I would say is you can create your own 8K content. I mean, the latest generation of Galaxy phones are able to to shoot in 8K, and you can then um, replicate that directly onto your um, your Q800 or your Q900 TV. So, what better way to enjoy 8K than um, you know your own footage? Um, there's also content available now on, on YouTube. We see that that continues to uh, to increase. Um, and we're also working with partners to try and get some dedicated 8K content as well. That's kind of ongoing from our part. Um, so I think those are those are the real options right now for 8K. If we're purely looking at 
getting something in 8K resolution. Um, but I think this this will only continue to grow. There's been some criticism, Craig, in, in the past that uh, your focus on 8K has meant that the 4K TVs have, uh, in some people's opinions, been downgraded or or less of a product. Is is that the case, or, or do you put just as much into your 4K lineup as you do the 8K? No, we we absolutely put as much as we uh, as much as we can into the 4K lineup as well. And um, you know, the, the the real judges are are, are the consumers and um, the, the test reviewers, guys like yourselves. I mean, we we take the feedback that we get very very seriously. Um, you know, products have to sit in certain parts of the market and they have to be accessible to a certain number of consumers. You know, there's always that business case that goes into bringing any product in the market. Otherwise, you could throw literally everything into a TV, but you'd end up with a TV that you know just wouldn't it wouldn't be competitive and you wouldn't be able to sell the volumes that you need to sell so that that balancing act always um, is always going on but i think if you look at our flagship model this year if you look at the, the qn95 which is the best 4k product that we do we haven't made a better 4k tv than that before and i and I, I, I would i would argue that that's as good if not better than anything that's out in the market and you know the, the the sales that we're achieving so far and the feedback that we've had from guys that really know what they're talking about guys like yourselves lets us know that you know that that's a hot product and we're doing the right thing excellent well i look forward to seeing the qn95 because like i say i haven't seen any of the tvs this year yet so i'm looking forward actually to uh, the qn95 does come with a slim one connect box doesn't it craig it, it does come with the One Connect box. It's not the same One Connect box that we use on the Q800 and the Q900. It's more of a separate um, type of solution, similar to what we've had in uh, in 2020 and before. But it's not as yeah, yeah. You can't attach it to the back of the stand the way you can with the the, the 8K TVs. But in terms of its dimensions, it's, it, it's it, it has it has slimmed down. But again, it's not yeah. it's not as slim as the the 800 and the 900 because they have to fit into the back of the TV stand okay. on those products. Well, we mentioned uh, the 4K lineup. Maybe you want to quickly run through what what the models actually are this year. So we have um, we have a QN95. So that's the the, the top of the, the 4K products. Um, we have a QN90. Um, so again, these are all Neo QLED. So the N indicates uh, Neo QLED. So if you see QN, that means you're getting a, a Neo QLED model with uh, the Quantum Mini LED technology. Uh, we have a QN85 as well. In terms of screen sizes. Um, we're now ranging from 50 inch, so there's a 50 um, inch model in the QN90, all the way up to 85. And again, looking at some larger screen options potentially for, uh, for the second half of the year. Um, <clears throat> below, we have our direct full array model, which is our Q80A. So this is um, still a very, very important part of the of the market for us. The, Q, the Q80 has been a fantastic seller in previous years, so um, brought that forward back into, into 2021. Then we go down to um, our Q70, Q60. So this is the kind of entry into the uh, the QLED market. Difference between the two models is the the Q70 is a predominantly 100 hertz panel uh, series with full HDMI 2.1 specification. Q60 um, is a, is a 50 hertz product. Doesn't feature all of the HDMI 2.1 spec, but does have a lot of that, like uh, um, ALM, uh, eARC, etc. Then below QLED, we still have a very, very big range of um, UHD products. So we still have our 7,000, 8,000, 9,000 series. Stepping up through those products, you'll get better designs, you'll get better smart features and functionality and better processing. That, that's generally how the how the architecture of the lineup works. And in terms of uh, panels, are they all VA or do you also have IPS in the range? Yeah, there's a there's a mixture of the two. So how how would uh, consumers know the difference? Is it like the QN, are they all VA uh, and below would be IPS or, or you know, is it is it mix and match? No, it's um, th there is no straightforward formula um, like that. So not one, no one series is pure IPS or uh, is pure VA. There is a, there is a mixture within there. However, we have various technologies behind that. So the panel is obviously one factor of delivering picture quality but we will have um, as an example on our va panels we will have um wide viewing technology we'll have a filter on there that improves the viewing angle so we all know ips is traditionally strong with uh, viewing angle va traditionally strong with uh, with black level so what we're doing is we're putting technologies into both of those types of products so that from a consumer point of view there isn't much difference in the uh, in, in the picture that's delivered and again i would always say to any consumer 
go and see the product. Go and see the product to make sure that you know the picture quality is the right type of picture quality for you, and it's going to fit into your to your living environment. Okay, well, who gets to ask the last question? Go on, <laughs> go on. Go on then, Steve. I know you're dying. Right. Go on. I feel sorry for Craig because he got asked this question so many times when he worked at Panasonic. Well, Panasonic, he's he's the same same with it at Panasonic yeah. <laughs> and just as you left, they they adopted it, and now you're at Samsung. You've got to answer the same no, no, question. They, they, they adopted it very much when I was still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either you or not having to answer the question. But um, I mean, given that every single other TV manufacturer, and I mean literally every single one, as far as I'm aware use uh, supports Dolby Vision and given that almost all the major streaming services with the exception of partially with the exception of Amazon they have t sort of tried it out as well but almost all of them support Dolby Vision um, streaming why does Samsung still refuse to uh, incorporate it into their TVs okay so so first and foremost so we we want to deliver the best HDR performance in the industry okay and I think we've been I think we've been leading the way in this for a number of years now now as a there's a big difference between supporting various HDR formats and delivering the best HDR experience. And I think sometimes that, that, gets, um, that gets forgotten. So our focus has been very much on improving the inherent capabilities of the TV when it comes to HDR, whether that be uh, peak brightness, color volume, APL, you know, the, the general components that will deliver uh, the best HDR experience. And we know most HDR content is still graded at, um, at 1,000 nits. We know that. Um, and we're able to deliver that content in its entirety. No, no tone mapping required. And obviously, that's where we want to get to one day, to a point where there is no need for, for mapping. You're, a, you're, you're set. Your TV is able to display exactly what the source content is, um, is, is giving it. You know, that's the, that's the holy grail. And we're delivering, as I say, that 1,000 that nit experience in its entirety. Whereas there are other sets on the market right now which are maxing out premium sets, which are maxing out at 700 nits, 600 nits, which are not even delivering 1,000 nit content in its entirety, let alone what they have to do to, uh, to compensate for content that's been created at 4,000 nits. So I think where we are is we can deliver a much better HDR experience with a static PQ curve with our products, which are achieving thousands of nits, some some very close to 4,000, than a set which can deliver 700 nits of peak brightness, but has access to that dynamic metadata. So the camp that we're in right now is Samsung is delivering the best HDR experience because ultimately it does come down to what your product can do, not which format it can support. Nevertheless, I've been in the industry a long time, and I've been on both sides of the uh, I've been on both sides of the, uh, the the discussion. And of course, having having access to the metadata, um, and then using that metadata to apply your picture processing and your quality the way that you want to do it would is 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 the best case scenario. And we actually have that in HDR10 um, and HDR10 Plus. That that allows us to do that, um, and that's why we that's why we've chosen the route that we've that we've chosen. Okay, I, I, it's a tough question. Thanks for being honest and answering it, Craig. The the other question I have for you is uh, obviously you mentioned static curve there. Um, your TVs have in the past been over bright, even in the cinema mode when it comes to PQ UTF tracking. Uh, have you taken that on board and have you made any changes this year, especially in cinema mode, as to how it, it tracks the PQ curve? Um, well, I mean, we're always taking that that feedback on board, and you know, there'll always be requirements, I think, for adjustments to be made when it comes to guys for you know, really using it to its full capability. You know, and obviously, you guys will be will be in that bracket. So um, you have to see when you when when you test it, when you get it hands on with it, to let me know, you know what you what you think about the the PQ curve and how it's being managed. But generally. I would say in our most accurate mode, we should be tracking the line as po as long as we possibly can. And then we tend to have a general roll off, um, which then preserves some of that that spectacular highlight detail. That's generally the approach that we've taken. OK, well, I think we've covered everything that we need to cover today. Uh, it's always great to see you, Craig. Thank you very much for your time. It really is appreciated. Um, so thank you very much for coming along today. Um, and much. that wraps up our podcast special. Uh, so thanks to Steve. Steve, thank you very much. You're very welcome, Phil. And please remember, 
you can like and subscribe and also hit the notification bell to be informed every time we upload new content to YouTube. Obviously, if you're watching or listening, I should say, uh, to the podcast, then of course you can also uh, send us questions and so on to podcast.avforums.com. And there are links to our Patreon. You'll find those on the YouTube page uh, in the description. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for watching and listening. And we'll see you for the regular podcast on Wednesday.